Hello everyone, this is Diane Elkins of eLearning Uncovered. In January 2020, Articulate came out with a new release for Storyline 360 that completely changed how screen readers interpret Storyline content. In this video, I'll walk you through the top five differences between the old approach and the new approach. But first, a disclaimer. I've spent a lot of time building and reviewing accessible courses in Storyline. However, I do not use a screen reader in my daily life. I have 2020 corrected vision, and I'm happy to share my experience and perspective, but I strongly encourage you to work with your learners to discuss what they are experiencing and the best way to approach accessibility in your organization. So let's jump in. Most of the changes are behind the scenes and will take effect as soon as you publish the course in version 3.36 or higher. Change number one, auto read content. In the previous approach, when users came to a new page, they had to initiate the action for anything to happen. So here I am in a published course from last year, and I've got the NVDA screen reader going. You'll be able to hear it in the background and can see the text off in this side panel. My focus is on the next button, and I press the space bar to activate it. What would you do now I'm on the new page. This can actually cause a usability issue because someone who can't see may not know they're on a new page. They aren't sure what to do. Now when I press tab, I do get that content. What would you do with extra time? In the new approach, the page content reads as soon as the page loads. Once again, I'm on the next button. I press space bar, the new page loads, and the screen time? reader starts. What you would do Clickable introduction, what would you do with extra time? What would you do if you had an extra two hours at work each week? To make this Type your thoughts here. Edit multi-line out of edit man typing on a laptop computer in a coffee shop. This, however, can be a mixed blessing. It is a commonly used approach for web content. And there's no missing the fact that new content has been presented. However, with e-learning, you may very well have audio that auto plays on your slide. So when a learner comes to the slide using a screen reader, the audio will be playing while the screen reader is reading. That's big. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it's big. So I'd recommend you work with target users to determine the best approach, such as giving learners an optional setting to stop the autoplay of the audio. So what exactly gets read automatically? Any content that is there at the beginning of the timeline. If you have something that appears at three seconds in, for example, that item will not be read automatically. However, once it does appear on the page, learn more about the learner can use the keyboard learn more to navigate to online. it. Tech. Learn more about using paper. Text appears as an overlay. Button. Now, synchronizing content has always been tricky from a usability standpoint. If new content is added at 5 or 10 or 15 seconds in, a screen reader user might not know the new content has been added and might miss it completely. Similarly, if objects disappear over the course of a slide, that student may not get to the content before it disappears, and once again, miss it completely. There are still a few kinks to work out with the auto-read function. I have had a few slides here and there where the content didn't auto-play, a few instances where an object such as the slide title played twice, and an instance where the player controls were read automatically in addition to the slide content. I know the team at Articulate is, um, is working to, to track down these items and see what's going on. Change number two, keyboard navigation. Here is a slide published using the old approach. You will learn keyboard six, users so and screen reader users who want to move around would tab would to each do? individual Type item on the here. page. Image of a man then they could use the space bar to activate buttons button. and other controls. As the author, you can control this uh, tab order via the tab order dialog box. Storyline authors have gotten used to this approach, but it can cause problems for our learners because that's not how most websites work. On most websites, when a learner uses the tab key, focus goes through only the interactive objects, not all the objects. And that's how it now works in the new Storyline approach. 
when I tab, Type it skips here. over text boxes and graphics and goes from interactive object to interactive button. object. Tabbing through only the interactive objects is really helpful for keyboard only users. If they can see, they don't need focus to land on every text box and every picture because they can see them just fine. They only need to tab to anything that might need their action. So in the old approach, they would need to tab many times to get through this slide and onto the next button. In the new way, they'd only have to tab three times. That's a big time savings and an especially important improvement with individuals for whom every tab takes notable effort. But what about screen reader users? They might need to go over every image and text box. Sure, the page auto reads, but they might want to go back and revisit an object or explore content that loaded later, which was not read automatically. For this reason, tab order works a little bit differently if a screen reader is running. Tabbing still goes from interactive here, object to interactive object. Skip, and again, Slide this is what they will likely expect. I was on a call with a screen reader student trying to explore a storyline course for the first time. It was published with the old approach. So he pressed tab and landed on a graphic. The screen reader announced it was a graphic and he was confused. He says, it said this is a graphic, nothing about it being interactive, but I tabbed to it. So I'm assuming it's interactive. I'm not sure what to do here. So tabbing now would not take him Skip to navigation. that graphic. Main landmark so slide. how would, would someone using a screen reader access the rest of the content? Do with, with the time? down arrow key. What if you're on a screen reader, the down arrow do key goes time? from object what to object, both interactive and non-interactive content. Again, this behavior is more in line with the rest of the web world and what a screen reader user is more likely to expect. And within text boxes, learners can use different shortcuts and commands to control what gets read when. For example, I can press control left arrow word. to read one you. word at a time. You. I've heard from screen reader you. users who Add. struggled with the fact that text boxes used to be all or nothing. They got read straight through without stopping. This new level of control can really help them process the information. I spoke with one user who sometimes uses a screen reader and sometimes uses a refreshable braille display. And for him with the braille display, the ability to control how much text was coming at him at a time was very helpful. There's still more work to be done with text boxes, for example, indicating when something is a bulleted list, a numbered list, or a heading would be helpful improvements. Change number three multiple choice questions. With the old approach, learners would tab to an option and press spacebar to, to select that option. Best. Section. Outlook radio button not checked 4 of 4. Online radio button not checked 3 of 4. Paper radio button not checked 2 of 4. It depends. Radio button not checked 1 of 4. Space. Checked. That worked well and was consistent with how radio buttons worked elsewhere. However, Auto-generated instructions for the JAWS screen reader said to use the arrow keys to make a selection. But you couldn't use the arrow keys to make a selection. So that caused a usability issue. Well, how does it work now? Keyboard-only users tab to the question and then use the arrow keys to make the selection. When they're done, they tab to the Submit button. For screen reader students, there are two different approaches based on whether they arrow into the options or tab into the options. If they tab Outlook into the options, it works the four. same as for keyboard users. They use Online the up and down arrow keys to make the four. selection, Paper and when they're done, they tab four. away to Online the submit button. button check two of four. Skip navig slide navigation navigation landmark submit button. Personally, I'm a little concerned about this design. If someone wants to explore the options, they have to change their answer as they go, even if they don't want to. Now, if they instead had arrowed into the options, they can then use the arrow keys to just move from option to option. And then they'd press spacebar to check. actually make a selection. Radio button not checked so the act of moving around and the act of selecting are two different things. Skip, navi 
which I believe is a better choice. Of uh, by the way, the folks that articulate were kind enough to answer uh, many of my questions that I had while putting this video together. So if you're listening, thank you for that. Um, in our conversations, they emphasized how helpful it is to get feedback from users. So if there's something you or your learners are struggling with, please share it with them. They are actively working on bugs and still working on new accessibility enhancements, and they'd love for you to be a part of that conversation. Okay, change number four, skip navigation. And you may have actually already noticed this change. So part of the WCAG standard requires that learners can skip repetitive elements that appear on every page. And in the case of a storyline course, that means the player elements. It would be maddening to have to go through all the player items on each and every page. Now, in the old and the new version, if you tab your way to the next button and activate it, you go on to the next page and you skip all of the player elements. If you don't activate the next button and keep tabbing, then you do go through the player elements. That's the same in both versions. But what if you went all the way through the slide and you want to go back and review the slide again? You wouldn't want to have to tab all the way around the player to get back to the start of the slide. So with the old approach, there was an invisible object just after the slide content and before the next button that let users jump back to the beginning of the slide and skip all of that repetitive content. That feature, however, had no visible representation. There was no visible text or icon and not even a focus indicator. A screen reader would pick it up. But a keyboard user, for whom it would also be helpful, wouldn't know it's there. They would just know there's this extra tab between the content and the next button that they weren't even sure what it was for. So in the new version, when you're done moving through the page content and you land on this feature, there is a visible representation. So any user can take advantage of it. Main landmark slide. Final quiz. And if for some Multiple reason you don't want the feature on at all, you can turn it off in the player dialog box. That's also where you can change the text that appears on screen and what the screen reader picks up for the skip navigation feature. Change number five, the player controls. Keyboard navigation now goes through the player differently. With the old approach, when I was done with the slide content, I would go previous, next, and then to the top of the player and around. Now the tab order goes counterclockwise. This seemed a little bit backwards to me at first, but I think it's a good change. Learners now go to the next button before the previous button which is good since they're more likely to want the next button than the previous button. And from there, it goes into the slide specific controls, which again, they'll need more often than the course level items like resources. There are also keyboard shortcuts that work while the seek bar is in focus. So while the seek bar is in focus, I can use the space bar to play and pause. Now, right now, as of version 3.37, those keyboard shortcuts are required to play and pause. It is not possible to tab to the play pause button or the replay button. That is something that the Articulate team is looking into. The player elements also have new behind the scenes tagging that hopefully makes it clearer what things are. Uh, for example, the closed caption button now indicates whether it's pressed or not. Uh, the menu has a little bit more information about what section you're in, how many sections, how many pages, uh, what's expanded and collapsed, etc. And as with the other new features, there are still some kinks they're working out and more enhancements along the way. So with everything I've experienced so far with the new approach, I've got four big takeaways. Number one, the new changes give screen reader and keyboard users more information and more control. That's a good thing. Number two, the new changes make courses behave more similarly to the rest of the web world. That's a good thing. Uh, number three, though, at the same time, there is more work to be done. There are still a few items, as I've mentioned, which are a little buggy and some that don't work at all. Uh, and number four, 
This is a big change you'll need to manage in your organization. If your developers and your learners are used to the old approach, it might feel like your courses are now broken. Both sides will need to learn a new way forward. And that's going to take time and communication. Uh, I'm excited to see where Articulate is headed with this. Uh, there's more work to be done, but it's a really big step in the right direction.